So the title of the session is Trial and Learning, Exploring How Parts of a System Interrelate. And what I'm going to try and share with you is some of the high points of the aha moments that I've had over the last 45 years, almost all of which I wish I'd had about 40 years earlier, would have made life far much simpler. And I'd like to start off with this particular model where I'm sitting in the kitchen in the morning having a pleasant breakfast and my wife yells down from upstairs, are you finally going to clean up that unsightly, ungodly mess around the bottom of the bird feeder because I'm getting tired of looking at it? And just as she does that, this whole series of relationships flashes before my eyes as, as to how it is that I got myself in this predicament. I deal with a lot of frustrations on an ongoing basis, and when I have a pleasant breakfast, it helps me deal with them. And for the last several days, there's been birds outside on the railing, and it helped me create a, have a pleasant breakfast, which helped with my frustrations. So after this went on for several days, I said to myself, self, why don't you install a bird feeder? Because it will increase the birds at the feeder and make increase the birds outside, and I'll have more pleasant breakfasts. So I installed the bird feeder and everything is well and good because not only does it do what I wanted it to do, it also improved the attractiveness of the garden, which attracted more birds, which then added to my pleasant breakfast and everything is just marvelous. And then I realized that, oh, I have to buy bird seed. And if you check the price of bird seed these days, it just added to my frustration. And not only that, the birds at the feeder create spillage, which increases the need to buy bird seed, which adds to my frustration. And the bird feeder attracts the universal eating machine, squirrels, which decreases the birds at the feeder, increases the need to buy bird seed, and increases spillage, increasing, further increasing the need to buy bird seed, which adds to my frustration. And additionally, the spillage promotes an unsightly growth, which I have to figure out how to clean up, which increases my frustration. And the spillage attracts rodents, which I have to figure out how to deal with, which is more frustration. And now the birds are pooping all over the railing and I have to figure out how to clean that up. And the question is, what's the real problem? So we'll leave that there for now and we'll come back to this later. So you can ponder what's the real problem here for a while as I talk, as I ramble on about all these other pieces. <clears throat> This, this journey started back in 1975 in some um, computer course and the instructor said, we're going to read Stafford Beer's platform for change during this class. Not that I recommend that you read it, but for me, it was kind of what they say is like taking a mind altering drug because all of the <clears throat> cosmic tumblers fell into place and I became an unbelievable evangelist for the systems paradigm to the point where when people asked me what I did and as I began to tell them, you could see their eyes glaze over as they were asking themselves, why did I ask and how do I get him to stop? So this, this went on, but in terms of developing models, I, I had this problem with a blank page because you know we, we've been trained since early childhood in school that you're not supposed to make mistakes. So I always wanted to start at the right place, but I didn't know where to start. So I got a blank page, so I can't start. If I can't start, I end up with a blank page and I have this vicious reinforcing cycle that's driving me nuts. <clears throat> but over time, I actually began to, to learn about system dynamics and, and developing stock and flow simulation models and, and qualitative relationship models. And all the time that I'm doing this, I'm, I'm reading and realizing that there are literally thousands of models and methods that claim to embrace the systems paradigm. And I'm scratching my head saying, well, system dynamics is just marvelous. Why do we need all these methods? Though at that time I ran into a work by Michael C. Jackson called Systems Thinking Creative Holism for Managers. And what that book provided me with was a model which said, if you look at the system in terms of being simple or complex. And if you look at all of the participants or stakeholders as being, well, they're either <clears throat> unitary in terms of they have a very similar goals and belief systems and they agree on a lot of things or pluralist where 
they agree on some things and they can come to an agreement on things that they're trying to deal with or coercive in terms of people that will never agree on anything. In each one of these domains, there are a number of approaches that are appropriate and are likely to produce some kind of results in, in that arena. You can't develop a system dynamics model for a, a group of people who can't figure out what the problem is they're trying to develop a model for. So this, this was marvelous because it gave me a way of, of realizing why we had all these models and methods. And if you have 660 euros to spare, you can buy the latest copy of the encyclopedia, but I'm not one of those people. So this was, this was marvelous for a while because I had an understanding. And then I said, self, you're not that smart. You've spent years wrestling with learning how to develop stock and flow simulation models. And now you have to learn a half a dozen different approaches to deal with all of these different contexts. So after being depressed for some short period of time, I realized that, <clears throat> that, that all of the models and methods are actually about one thing. And it's just about understanding relationships and their implications. So I got to a point where I could understand what all of the different approaches were doing. And I didn't have to argue with people about their approaches because I could connect with what it was that they were doing. And I realized that there were only three fundamental foundational underlying structures in existence. So that there's independent growth or decline, there's goal seeking or balancing structures, or there's exponential growth reinforcing structures. And that's all there is. It doesn't make any difference how complex the model is that, that gets developed. It's just a bunch of them pasted together in certain ways that create patterns of behavior <clears throat> that occur over and over and over again. So from there, I got to the archetypes, that set of patterns that occurs over and over and over again. <clears throat> and I'll walk through part of this in that if you're looking at a situation you can either look at it as I have a problem to fix, which is a goal seeking structure, or I'm trying to promote growth, which is a reinforcing structure. And those fundamental underlying structures have a typical pattern of evolution so that this can fix a problem, can evolve into linear progress, slows over time, or over time there's a tendency to settle for less, which is drifting goals or the fix overshoots the goal, which is oscillations, or things seem to oscillate endlessly back and forth, or, and this, it just goes on, they're connected together because of the nature of the structure. <clears throat> and the nice thing about archetypes, which I now call fre frequently recurring structures, is they have a very well-defined structure, which produces a characteristic pattern of behavior, and there are well-defined strategies for dealing with them. And if you get to this model that I developed in Insight Maker, every one of these elements will take you to a, a Insight Maker simulation model, which is a story that will tell you about the causal loop diagram and about the simulation. And it will allow you to walk through it and actually experience the patterns of behavior of the simulations and you can play with them to your heart's content to better understanding the implications of the relationships. So it's just part of the nature of the monster, I guess. So if I get back to here, wherever I was. <clears throat> so along the way, I developed this program called the Certified Systems Thinker Program. And people thought I was really presumptuous, and I probably was. And the first people that went through it gave me these rave reviews that I so good that I thought I was being had. And then somebody went through it. Well, a couple people went through it. And when they finished it, this, this is a sequence of, of 
videos that you can watch and exercises that you can do probably in two or three days. They came back and said, okay, uh, forget this one. How do I, the question was, I'll put, I'm, I'm disconnected from my own model. Someplace along the way, <clears throat> I, had this, I had this realization that a model is like a play. And because I used to labor over these models for a long period of time and I would send them to other people. And if they sent back anything in a couple of days, they'd say something like, well, that's nice. But what they really want to say is, why did you send this to me? Because I never gave them a way to really understand what I thought the model portrayed or embraced or what the insights were. And then I made this connection between a model and a play. If you go to the play and you sit there and you watch the relationships unfold between the actors, from one act to another, at the end of the play, if it was done relatively well, you leave and you take the story with you because as Bateson said, it's the pattern that connects. What we as systems thinkers have done forever is akin to having the playwright walk up to you and you the script. You haven't seen the play, but they give you the script and five minutes later they say, what do you think? You simply don't have a prayer of consuming the, the meaning or the content of that piece of work in that period of time in that form. So I ended up starting doing video voiceovers like unfolding this model and talking about it as I unfold it. And you don't have to read anything. You just listen to me ramble on about what I think I think. And you can then send me comments about how far underwater you think I am. So back to this certified systems thinker program, a couple of people went through it and they said to me, okay, the program is marvelous. Now, how do I sell systems thinking to my organization? And I had a meltdown for a couple of days. Well, probably for a couple of weeks, but if they asked the question, I had to think about it. So I did. And over time, I came up with these, these five dimensions that I thought made sense as to why you can't sell systems thinking to your organization. And you should never try because it's a, it's a fool's errand. <clears throat> People always, always, always do exactly what makes the most amount of sense to them in the context of the moment based on their current understanding. And I've discussed this particular perspective with people endlessly, and, and nobody has yet found one white crow to cause me to change my mind. The implication is that you, whatever you do makes sense to you. You, you. you can't violate that. And if it doesn't make sense to me, it's not because of something you don't understand, it's because of something I don't understand. Because if I were you, I would be doing the same thing. So it gets us to Covey's sixth habit of highly effective people seek first to understand and then to be understood. So, so based on that awareness of people doing what makes sense to them, I read this book by Spencer Johnson in the late 80s called The One Minute Salesperson. And, and what I got out of the book didn't show up until 25 years later. And there's a line in it where he says, almost everyone loves to buy, but no one likes to be sold. And I connected that with the thought about somebody wandering around a department store, looking at things and the clerk walks up and says, may I help you? The typical response is, no, I'm just looking or something like that. And I actually stopped and thought about why is that the response? And I concluded that the story that runs through the person's head in about a microsecond is, how can this person be so presumptuous as to believe I need help? I'm perfectly capable of helping myself. So by, by going to other people and, and inferring that they need to learn systems thinking, you've just discounted them. You know, I've, I, someplace along the wrong way, I wrote this paper called change management, the Columbo approach, which you, if you've ever watched any of the episodes of Columbo, 
uh, he just he had this knack of discounting himself and asking questions, trying to get other people to help him understand. So that that by asking for help, you bring toward people towards you, and when you tell them things, you push them away. So so this was part two, and part three was, what's the first rule of Fight Club? Don't talk about Fight Club. So because if you if as I was saying, if you go to someone and imply that they need to learn systems thinking, you just discounted them, you're selling them, and it's not consistent with what makes sense to them. And you're essentially telling them that what you believe doesn't make sense, and I'm smarter than you are, so you should listen to me. So it just it doesn't get you anywhere. And then Buckminster Fuller said that you shouldn't endeavor to change people's minds. What you should do is give them a tool to work with that causes them to change their own minds. And I arrived at the thought that the systems thinker is a tool to get people to change their mind, but you have to approach it in a way that doesn't violate all these other things. So I evolved the stealth approach to acquainting people with systems thinking. And the last part is, from a leadership perspective, Lao Tzu, I think it was, that you, when you honor people, they honor you, and you, you all of the stuff up here discounting people violates this. So you, you, you don't get anywhere. When, when the sage has finished his work, the people will say, we did it ourselves. So all of that got me to a point of, there's a book by the Heath brothers called Moments, which the Heath brothers have written several books, Fix and Stitch and Upstream and Moments. And, and I think they're all chapters in one book on change. And the, the, what they presented was the way to communicate is to take a clear insight, compressed in time, presented in a way that enables the audience to discover it. You, you allow the audience to have an aha moment. So the, the stealth approach, you know, I, I concluded some time ago that for most people, modeling is an unnatural act. Okay? They would rather have a root canal than sit down and develop a model because they don't know how to develop models. They never learned how to do it. You can go to school and you, you can get first graders to develop models very easily, but adults, no. So what, so what you do is you go and you sit down with somebody who's wrestling with this problem, this situation, and you ask them to help you understand because they understand your problem, their problem far better than you will ever understand their problem. So you, ask them to help you understand. And, and as they begin to tell you, you say, can I take notes? And the notes that I take look like a model. <clears throat> and after a few minutes, I begin to ask questions about the, the notes that I've been taking. And it's really amazing that within 15 or 20 minutes, the person is, well, you know, you really should add this piece and connect this piece here and connect this piece over here. <clears throat> and they're doing modeling, but we never talked about modeling. We never talked about system. We never talked about anything. All we ever talked about is what are you wrestling with? Right. And, and it just, I call it the stealth approach and it seems to work well. So, so from there, what, what am I doing? I don't know the, this is back to the, we have a problem, problem or situation, which connects back to only archetypes. And, you know, I, I develop a lot of them. I develop far too many models. But trying to understand what the model says is, is an ongoing endeavor. So this model was repurposed from a couple authors, and it was really well done. And I wanted to use it for storytelling because it unfolds really nicely. And it talks about the difficulties associated with dealing with with unwanted pregnancies and births and, and sex education and all that stuff. And the question was, how do I simplify this? So I, I tried to simplify it 
by abstracting it. And the abstraction was as complicated as the one I started with, which wasn't getting me anywhere. And then in the, but in the process of doing this, I had this aha moment that says, oh, this structure is just two shifting the burden structures bang together because this part is all of those pieces. And this part is all of those pieces. And this part is the other pieces. And in doing that, I found out there's two relationships that are not actually presented in this model. And I can probably explain this to somebody in, in a few minutes, and this one might take hours, okay? So it's, it's back to, the, to my own personal thought that, that if you think about a movie, think about Armageddon, if you've seen it, they tell you several little stories to begin with interactions between people, but you don't know how they all connect. And then as the movie progresses, they give you a sense of how these little stories all merge together to give you a, a larger narrative about what's going on. So my thought is that no matter how complex the model is, at the center of it someplace, there's one or a small number of archetypal relationships that are responsible for the overall behavior of the structure, which takes me back to, we have a problem. <clears throat> Would anybody like to tell me what they think the root of the problem is here? Somebody jump in, I'm dying here. <laughs> Susan. Do I have to get rid um, of my wife? <laughs> no, you have to get rid of the, your happiness being outside of yourself. Okay. How how does that relate to the to the model? Where's I'm having well, trouble. Because, I'm, so your moods are attached to birds that are outside of yourself. Your it's an external motivation. And, okay. and so if you were to um, base you know, your moods on something you have control over, then the birds would be nice, but it's not going to drive you to um, continue focusing on the external motivations. Okay. That, if, that's, if that's wrong, that's, you know, that's fine. That's just what came to mind. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that... I think there are a multitude of, of meaningful answers. Okay. And, and, you know, getting rid of my wife is not one of them. All right. So, but then, then there's a question about, well, <clears throat> is it a bad design for the bird feeder? So should well, maybe, I design it Maybe, better? Gene, if you were to, <clears throat> maybe if you were to plant sunflowers, <laughs> that would make your garden more attractive and the birds would have a natural source of feed and their bird poop would fertilize the sunflowers and yes. you could have a more pleasant breakfast and um, not have to clean up the uh, bird poop on the railing. And I could look at the sunflowers, right? Yeah. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the essence of this structure is, is actually a shifting the burden archetype in that in so many instances, we treat the symptoms of the problem, not the underlying cause of the problem itself. And the side effects distract us from the need to actually pursue the fundamental solution. So if, if I spent time actually figuring out where the frustration is coming from and dissolve the frustration, all the rest of this just goes away. I, I had a situation where we, myself and a number of other people, worked with a customer for months and developed this elaborate qualitative relationship model that, that looked a lot like the Afghan strategy model, which is completely uninterpretable. And then we turned it into a simulation, which was even worse. And then one morning I woke up and said, hmm, we just wasted a ton of money because it's just a shifting the burden problem. They're spending all their efforts dealing with the symptoms and they're not addressing the underlying 
cause of, of the symptoms, so nothing's getting any better. And <clears throat> that almost got me fired. But uh, <laughs> back to, to this. So <clears throat> the idea is learning about the fundamental underlying structures is a good idea because I, I think back to, I, I used the, <clears throat> the political antics in high-tech organizations used to drive me crazy. And when I learned about the archetypes, all of the antics became a great source of humor because I could see what was going on and I knew when to walk away and not get involved because I can get beat up. <clears throat> so um, once by, uh, between 2010 and 2017 or 18, I had a website called systemswiki.org that was full of models and, and my ISP went south and nothing actually got lost, but I knew I didn't want another wiki. And then last October, I started developing musings in Substack, which the uh, link for it, I just dropped in the chat. <clears throat> and what, well, before I did that, I developed <clears throat> what, what I called the Phoenix Project trying to put some order in this chaos that I created over an endless period of time, which is access to everything I've ever created one way or another. And there's just this whole ton of models in there. So that this is, this is everything I know about Insight Baker and, and everything I know about <clears throat> storytelling and Kumu. And there's just, every time I think about working on this, I become catatonic so that that wasn't getting me too far. So I decided to start developing musings, which are short one to two pages of thoughts with a, um, with a video in most of them. And I pump them out one or two a week and people seem to be happy with them, but that's one of them. And then it got to a point where I'd read a text on Facebook or, or LinkedIn, and I'd like to show somebody one of my musings, but I couldn't remember which, which one I wanted to show. Because there's, there's 60 of them that I created in the last couple of months. So I had to develop, <clears throat> develop this Kumu project, which is Systems Wiki's Musings Musings, which is... <clears throat> all of the musings gem together in an environment where they're all tagged with, with tags and connected together and you could search them all. And, and it's, uh, that's where I am at the moment. So questions? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Gene. That was, um, this is the second or third time I'm, um watching this uh, obviously every time there is different variation but every time i watch it learn something new um there are a bunch of questions um in in the chat one is from susan um can you speak more about shifting the burden so um guys uh, we, we pretty much we are at the point that you can ask away your questions and have a conversation so we start with susan but going forward um, if you like you can type your mm -hmm. questions in the chat or just raise your hand and we will go through them. So um, over to you, Susan. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah Gene, I love the, um, the, if you can repeat the three, um, wasn't the archetypes, but it was, it was the, I guess the shifting the burden, but you had actually spoken more to seeing through to three different um, structures. These three? Yes. <clears throat> Is that, does that tie back to shifting the burden? Well, it, if, you, if you look at the, the, uh, the shifting the burden structure, <clears throat> it's, it's two balancing exactly. loops, all right? Two yep. goal-seeking loops and because of the nature of this loop itself over here, that's a reinforcing loop. So it's a vicious side effect that defeats 
the appearance or the awareness that you need to work on this. It's a, this is the problem with homelessness, so that you have homeless people on the street, so you build shelters, which takes them off the street, so you don't realize, you don't notice them, so you stop thinking about the fact that, you know, if you're going to solve the homeless problem, you have to figure out how to enable them to become self-sufficient. It's, it's the old feed a person a fish and you feed them for a day and teach them to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. <clears throat> if we haven't, haven't already overfished all the fisheries, but um, that's another problem. Okay. Right. Okay, good, yes, that's great. But once you, once you go through and you study, <clears throat> study the archetypes, you begin to see them everywhere. And, that, and that's the reason that they're archetypes because they happen over and over and over again. The first time I ran into this was in a book called Uncommon Sense, The Life and Thought of Ludwig Bertalanffy, who was an Austrian biologist considered by most to be the father of modern system theory. And, and he claimed back in the 30s that there were fundamental underlying structures that operated across all branches of science. And when I first ran into it, I said, well, this is crazy. How can that be? And then I said, oh, the branches of science are a fabrication of us, not nature. So why wouldn't there just be one set of structures that operates everywhere? And what he wanted to do was general systems teaching so that if you learned about the structures, if you migrated to another environment, you had to figure out what the structures were and what the labels on them were. <clears throat> and and do all of the archetypes lead back to the core issue the core problem well <clears throat> the archetypes lead back <clears throat> okay the there is If you, if you take <clears throat> tragedy of the commons, multiple consumers of some resource that's, that's not being managed and they're over consuming it, the difficulty there is different than the shifting the burden. In other words, each one of the structures has within it <clears throat> an aspect that's, that's causing the difficulty. Now, okay. a lot of people look at the archetypes because all of the archetypes are negative. I mean, if you find one, you don't want it, right? Because they're, they're all bad. Though, if you look at it in a different way, if you say, I'm going to set out to do this. And the first thing you then do is say, okay, like Stingy said, you can never do just one thing. So will you say, all right, I'm going to set out to do this, but what's likely to show up to create a fixes that fail or a drifting goals or so that I can look at this and say, here's the way that this would typically evolve. How do I dissolve those pending problems before they happen? Sorry, I don't do short answers. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that, that, yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll let somebody else ask a question, but that, that, uh, that definitely had my mind go <laughs> where it needed to. I, I do have a question, but I want to open up for the audience, Miriam. Oh yeah, thank you. But if you have a question, you can go first. No, right. please, you go ahead. Hey, hi, Jean. Thanks for this. Um, I've also seen this a couple of times and it's always uh, interesting. And I have a question to you, like just based on your experience. I'm a trained system dynamicist and sort of working in the practice field. And one question I quite often come across is like, how do I hold the balance between telling the story and making the model work for the client, which is quite often not in line with the modeling um, process <laughs> sort of so yeah and I sometimes have this tension that the model if any system dynamicist would see it would probably cringe and hate it but it totally did the job for the client um, 
and it solved, I guess it still had the meaning in it, but I needed, like, for example, I've, um, when you work with government at the moment, you can't have a problem. <laughs> like, <laughs> everything has to be an opportunity. <laughs> so it makes well. it really tricky <laughs> to model a problem. And um, so that, that was one question I just wanted to ask you. How, how do you deal with that tension? I ask a lot of questions. As opposed to trying to, you know, it's, it's like, okay. <clears throat> if I tell them this, they're not going to like the answer. So I figure out several questions that I can ask so that they figure out it's their perspective. Mm -hmm. You get what is it? You can get, you can accomplish almost anything in an organization as long as you're not overly concerned about who gets credit for it. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I just I just posted a link to this Kumu model, which is the source of this presentation. I'm here all night. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Tina, I had a question in the chat, which was um, the, I like the, if you could explain some of those archetypes back to the bird example that you had in the first uh, one and just maybe highlight one of each of those archetypes and those reinforcing structures just so I can get a bit of a better idea of being able to spot them. Thank you. Okay, so, <clears throat> so if you start out with a reinforcing structure, it can devolve into partners for growth become adversaries, which is an accidental adversary structure where two people or more than two people operating collaboratively could accomplish far more than what happens if they begin to focus on their own success, which impacts each other's success. It's, it's, an ugly looking structure, but that's what it does. <clears throat> Oftentimes the growth leads to decline elsewhere so that it's, that's essentially a um, self-fulfilling prophecy where the, the manager believes that this person is more competent than this person. So they spend more time working with them. So, of course, they, they get better and the other one gets worse and they end up firing them. Firing them. The um, limited resources shared by others, which is the tragedy of the commons, which means there are multiple consumers of a resource and either they're exceeding the carrying capacity, they're using it faster than it can replenish itself, or it's a fixed resource and they're just not collectively managing that resource. Now, for each one of these archetypes, there is, if you walk through the story, it will talk, it will unfold the structure and explain it at the bottom, and it will do simulations for you. And then it will also, at the end, <clears throat> explain to you the strategy for dealing with the structure. And each one of them has a very well-defined set of approaches for dealing with the structure. Um, this more than one limit to be addressed, which is called the attractiveness principle, so that oh, uh, growth, growth slows over time, which means <clears throat> consider a reinforcing structure that has some limit, okay? The, if you're doing advertising, growing your market, you get to a point where you've consumed the market. The limit is the size of the market. So if you want any grow anymore, you can't focus on advertising. You have to figure out how to expand the market, okay? Because the, the size of the market is the limit to the growth. and and. You know, this goes on and on and on, but, but the <clears throat> things get better and then they get worse, which is a fixes that fail. 
And then that evolves into the underlying cause not being addressed, which is the shifting the burden, which often evolves into an addiction so that you can remove the symptoms, but they're still addicted to the side effect. So I'm smiling, uh, Gene, because uh, the question Eric asked, um, Eric and I and work, work in the same some similar sort of organizations and it's uh, everything you said, I can, we can see the pattern, right? So we have some technology capacity and people and everyone is fighting for them. And we have the tragedy of coming there because they deplete quickly, they get to a point where they're overusing technology and take all technology is doing instead of doing, delivering something, they're just meeting in all these negotiation, um, going into all these negotiation sessions to somewhat coordinate all of that. So they're effectively spending 50, 60% of their productive time on negotiating rather than <laughs> doing the work because the people who need their services cannot get together and agree on or cannot collaborate. So um, really good question. Daniel, I feel you have a question. Well, be before, you, before you move on, for each one of these, you can just go down here and you can walk through the story Every one of them also has an associated video that I do a video voiceover that describes the unfolding, describes the story. So, amazing. Thank you. There was another question. Yeah. Thanks, um, Aladad. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, just pondering. Um, is there any archetype or way that the archetypes can be banged together to um, to get like a kind of a staircase pattern with a series of plateaus? And the reason I'll, I'm asking I'll... that is um, where you one place where you see that kind of pattern, and I guess it's positive, unlike what most of the archetypes have been characterized, is where you get um, breakthrough performance. So, you know, no, the normal pattern is like you've got that linear linear progress slows over time you hit the plateau but with uh, a creative team they might then eventually break oh, I, I, know another, you, I know to the next plateau and so <laughs> forth and my reason for asking is it might give some insights into um into fostering those kinds of um um happy situations give me two or three days i'm currently working on a music called goals a self-limiting concept. Oh, I love the sound okay. of that. Okay, so it, it's it's in the works. It'll be out. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll keep an eye out on LinkedIn or um, so, or this group for the update. Uh, can I just so, can I just just mention before we finish and you drop off, um, uh, Gene, did, did you want to just briefly talk about if folks want to learn about Kumo and what is the channel they can use to get in touch with you? Um, please, by all means, I think it, a lot of folks will benefit from that. Did you want to just share how they can get in touch with you, books at some time, and then you offering some sort of a support on using the tools? There, there's my calendar. And just to be clear, so to everyone, I think we talked about it before. Um, you can book half hour, one hour, and it's, uh, I think it's sort of free service, right? Obviously, I yeah. don't think you don't mind if I, you pay for it, but I, 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 retired offer, I retired 15 years ago. Now I only work 80 hours a week. Okay. Well, you know, it's. <clears throat> A little over a year ago, I tried to retire, and then I spent a year being depressed. Uh, and now I'm back, and I feel really good. So, um, I just, I, it's, it's a disease. I can't stop. The, the thing was, <clears throat> I, you know, I there's tell an people, archetype uh, for that, Jane. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> I, t I tell people, I'm a recovering systems thinker. I work with people to develop stories about relationships and their implications. And their next comment is, well, isn't that sort of about everything? And I say, yeah, that's the curse because, because everything is fascinating because it's, 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 I, my thought is there are no things. 
There are only relationships and their implications. Now, when we develop models, we bundle a whole set of relationships together and we put a label on them so we don't have to deal with all of the detail. So if I write car, how many relationships are in that bundle, okay? But I develop a relationship between the car and the driver. Well, the driver is a ton of relationships, but I don't want to deal with them, right? So I don't know, whatever. Oh, I'll give you this. This is this, this. one that I'm I'm most proud of. This is the uh, uh, an explanation of how I go about creating models these days. So this is forty five years of trial and learning distilled down to six statements. Can you share that link? <laughs> so I begin with a situation or a topic that I want to understand. I will not map the dreaded S word um, or ecosystems or any of that. I have to start with a situation, a thing that I want to understand. And I ask one question in two forms. And the question is, and? And that's my universal approach to understanding the universe. And? And what influences this? And what does this influence? And I asked questions two and three repeatedly as I synthesize the set of relationships and their implications. And then I explain my model to someone else and ask them what's missing. And then I don't be an idiot and argue with them about what they think. That, that was, Gene, that was fascinating. I remember when we were leading up to the session and we were having some pre-meeting and you mentioned that all, all there is the system thinking, it's, it's just looking at the relationships. And I kind of, that hits me. I recently wrote a series of tweets about worldly mapping, you know, some of the folks here are familiar, and I look at it from a relationship perspective, and I say, oh, effectively, worldly mapping is a specific way about bundling relationship and putting them across the time. So when you when you think about it, um, it's, if we think about system thinking is just a way to make sense of, to see and make sense of relationships, and everything else fit into. Initially, when you said that, I, I was quite uncomfortable because all, all, I'm, all, I'm all about models and techniques and various traditions of system thinking and all thousand, you know, system thinking methods. But it was quite, it was, it was quite um, insightful and and just mind blowing for me. Um, so I certainly appreciate that aspect. Um, Martin, you. I see that you are off mute. Did you want to ask a question, mate? Um, yeah, I'm trying to articulate a question. <clears throat> I think it's related oh, Matt. to um, the question that was asked before that Miriam asked about how there are no real problems. There's only opportunities to get better. Or we know that those with power rise to the top of organizations and we know that organizations that have good cultures encourage it to be safe to say so that they can repair themselves or address certain issues but i don't know could you talk a little gene about power power distribution in um in in organizations and how it affects how problems get named and how resources get allocated because your premise is that everybody follows their own self-image or their own self-interest. Uh, it, it seems right, yet we all know cases where people um, do things, believe things, say things that are not in their best interest. You know, people who deny the science about getting vaccinated and so forth, and and they play into some myths about um, their best interest. Uh, Matt, it's a half-baked half question. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. 
the, the comment wasn't that they act in their own best self-interest. They act in a manner that makes sense to them. Now, at the moment that they do that, considering all of the context within which they're within and what they understand at that moment, that action makes sense. A moment later, it may not make sense. You know, it made sense to put my hand on the hot burner until I did it, and then it didn't make any sense at all. And we often find ourselves in situations where what we do makes sense at the moment, though in the larger context over an extended time frame, it makes no sense whatsoever because it's not in our self-interest or, or all of those around us. But if I, but if I only think about if I don't stop and think about the implications of what I'm about to, I mean, we, we spend most of our life operating on autopilot so that we, you know, we don't spend time doing an in-depth thought about the implications about what we're supposed to do when we build bird feeders, like the problem here. Then, so if we stopped and actually looked at the, you know, Singhi said, you can never do just one thing. So you have to say, I understand that I have to look at the, the relationships that are created by the action that I take. And what are those implications? And how do they play out over time? And, and that's a half baked answer to your half baked question. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about power. Talk about power. <laughs> the models seem to ignore power. Um, okay. Mm. I, I, um, okay. People, I think that people exercise power out of insecurity. My my organizational guru is one unbelievable um, author of Maverick, Ricardo Semler. Took over a small manufacturing firm from his father in Brazil um, decades ago. And, and he has a mindset that just is, is bizarre. Though it works, he, he believes that you empower people to excel as opposed to attempting to control them. I mean, it's, Maverick talks about at one point in time in the, in the evolution of the company, he decided to teach all of the departments about running their own business. And so he taught them about bookkeeping and finance and accounting and all this other stuff. <clears throat> and one department decided that he was charging them too much rent, so they moved out. And he said, I don't know where they moved to, but it doesn't matter because they always deliver on time. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, it's a strange mindset. If you, if you want to get a sense of just how strange his mind is, hold on, similar, Ricardo, similar. Um, uh, here's a TED talk that he did that just, every time things get me down a little bit, I go watch this TED Talk. I mean, he, over the years, he's started 30 companies with an average annual return on investment of 46%, which is pretty good. Very good. So, I see some, someone else has found this TED Talk. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Gene. Yeah. Well, I think Ali Dad's had to run off at twelve, so um, so we will keep going. Though there's a few questions still, I think. That yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, I said I'm here all night. <laughs> Excellent. Um, <clears throat> I, I was actually musing on. Um, on basically the shift the burden type archetype 
and um, it's particularly around the homelessness model and capturing the narrative. But the it seems seems like uh, what happens is the but the, the 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 quick fix it's not really a quick fix, but the, the the fix which becomes popular captures the narrative, and they don't. It's very hard, then I think, then to actually get back to what is the real problem. Does that seem to be something that that happens, especially I think in a power dynamic, the bias to whoever owns the narrative then will probably own it, if you like, unless it's challenged in some way. Does that sound right, or am I barking up the wrong tree, Gene? The, the, the people who have the funding, I mean, you can't do anything without funding, <clears throat> want to look good. Some of them want to do good, but they also want to look good, and they're looking for short-term results. You know, so if you, if you go to the funders and you say, in a decade, we can accomplish all of this, they say, ah, go away. Go away. You know, they go, you know, tell, tell me what you can accomplish in the next quarter. Um, so they, the, based upon the way that they drive the system, ugh, sorry, the way they drive the structure, it, they doom it to, to short-term actions, which don't learn, lead to long-term results. You know, the, the, the more shelters you build, the more shelters you will have to build in the future. And I just I just did a musing on homelessness. I don't know. A couple of days ago, the twenty first actually. Um, oh, sorry. I was going to jump in, Dave. Not all good, Daniel. Yeah. So when you when you say, Gene, they they want to look good. Is it fair to say that in the wider system, uh, look good in the short term? Is it fair to say that in the wider system, they have to look good in the in the in the short term? I guess I'm thinking about politically appointed or democratically appointed entities. They'll be that, that, that they may have a legitimate um, fear of being voted out. Yeah, somebody told me once it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> yeah, I want to know. <laughs> it's just you know, there's, there's a, whatever is happening is is driven by a broader context, driven by a broader context, and of course, of course, I also someplace I saw it written that. You can't solve all problems in the context of the entire universe unless your name is Carl Sagan. So, yeah, I, Dave, can I segue out of that, or do you want to keep going in the, along this one? No, of course, Dan, take it away. <clears throat> um, something that surprised me reading one of um, Eli Goldratt's last books was he made what, what seemed like a counterintuitive claim, but then I thought it had some sense that when you stare at um, say two systems and one has many, many connections, that looks from a, a superficial point of view as more complicated than where the many elements have less connections. But his argument was it's the reverse because having interconnections reduces the degrees of freedom. But as with some of the examples you've shown today, it can be hard to pair away the, um, the complexity and see the, and see the essence. Um, I'm not sure if I believe that claim, so I'm I'm asking um, Eugene as someone with far more experience well, right. in these matters. I, I haven't read the book, so would you give it to me one more time? What was the claim? Um, okay, so the claim is consider two systems, say with um, four entities to keep it fairly small. In one case, they're not interconnected. In the other case, there's the, edges connect everything. So like a complete graph or network, which is the more complex. And the claim is most people look at that and see the high interconnection as a proxy for complexity, but looking at it from a degrees of freedom point of view, having lots of interconnections, although it increases the apparent complexity, if you can get a, a handle on what's happening, it's simpler but you've got to see through the complexity. Okay. Um, 
Give me just a moment. Uh... And I'll see if I can go hunting for a visualization. Okay. So consider this. <clears throat> this this is essentially from the work of Chikstent Mahali, where <clears throat> the way that he defined complexity was well integrated and interrelated. In other words, the example he used was you take, take a movie camera that has tons of features and functions, but they don't work well together. So it's, so it's complicated. But if you take a movie camera that doesn't have very many features and functions, it's easy to understand and use, but it's mundane. So that you, you know, and his claim was that that, that which is well understood and differentiated and integrated is actually complex. And that's the typical evolution of things is, and, and I made the connection between his diagram and, and the sequence of data information, knowledge and wisdom that was done by somebody else, I don't remember who, and laid them on top of each other. And it seemed to make a lot of sense. Does that help or am I just being confusing? I think if you can post the link, it's one I'd have to digest. It might have been Akoff who, 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 was. who yeah. did the sequence. Um, That's right. And, and people beat me up because, <clears throat> because I disagreed with him that he puts understanding in the sequence. And my point was that you get from one level to the next because of understanding so that there is understanding at each level. But you know, we, lots of us have different perspectives. Thank you. Jeannie, you've been very patient with your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, um, sorry, this is, I'm gonna go completely not um, uh, all uh, very um, heady as, as you two are discussing, uh, way over my head, but I am back to the homeless problem and other problems where the solution might not be obvious. So uh, <clears throat> I, I read a headline. I, it was just a headline. I didn't actually read the whole thing, but it triggered me to talk about this. It was, there was uh, 500 a month or 500 a week given to um, a, a set of homeless people. And what they did over time was they lifted themselves out of poverty with that basic amount. Um, and they ended up getting jobs and, you know, supporting themselves um, over time with some basic minimum income. Um, there's, you know, and, and that wouldn't be necessarily obvious to anybody to think of that solution or popular for that matter, wouldn't be popular, just give them money, a regular um, income. And I think along the same lines, maybe different is the the story of the wolves in Yellowstone and reintroducing <laughs> wolves to Yellowstone and how that changed the whole ecology of that environment. That even seemed uh, to, to have the uh, side effects that uh, beneficial effects that even no, like nobody predicted the, those beneficial um, side effects with regards to how it would impact the trees and the the fauna, flora and fauna of the whole area. Um, right, and, is there a question here? I don't know. <laughs> I um, guess I guess if you're in the middle of a problem set, and you know, are you trying to think of novel novel solutions for those problem sets that might not? be obvious, obvious relationship. Um, uh, most, most of the real good solutions are not obvious. 
they 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 come from these aha moments right the, the <clears throat> this organization who developed a new set of products that were very well received in the market and and they just could not produce enough to keep up with demand sounds like tesla um and so the support organization was having trouble providing support services to their customers and the whole organization was growing and where's the best place for the rest of the organization to get resources from that know the company the customer and the product you steal them from support okay so the the typical answer is you put out a, a policy saying the organization can't hire from support which is good from for support but not the rest of the organization and Akoff said, never improve a part unless it improves the whole, which is a phenomenal statement. So the, the non-intuitive answer for this is you change the, the goals for support and you give them additional funding and you tell them to hire more people than they need and train them. And we're going to evaluate you on the number of your people that the organization steals from you. Uh, I just... It's a crazy solution, but it's it's completely not obvious, or not wasn't to me anyway. You're you're muted, Jen. It's hard to justify those propositions. Um, uh, I mean, you can draw a model of what you think will happen. Is that is that the idea? Draw the do the model of what you think will happen if you if you do this, but you can't be I, sure. Well, being being sure of almost anything is really difficult. Though, though, to to ask the questions about okay, if we continue down the path that we're going, where does it get us? Okay, the organization is. Well, we've created an accidental adversaries scenario between support and all the other organizations in the company. And, and that's not going to end well. Right? So how do we solve both of these problems at the same time? And keep noodling it with people, some other people until they figure out that it's their idea. Um, Susan, did you have anything to add? You've got your hand up as well, or is that a goodbye hand? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I, want, I wanted to ask, which kind of adds on to um, Janine's question, and I'll say uh, what uh, Jane put in the uh, chat, but if, if someone does not grasp self-organizing systems, and or paradox then and yeah what what i what i see a lot of times is is that they presume they have more power than they actually have they they think that they can deem the power they deem the system change and and they can't because it's the system not not them how do you how do you deal with that because are they going to come to that conclusion because it, yeah i just get into these loops with people without well, with trying uh, not to explain things because i agree with you i mean once you once you start down that path then they get insulted well, because this this i think there's a level of there's a degree or a level or what you know and there are those people who can stand face to face with an alien and still claim there are no aliens okay i mean that just so you have the to US realize guys. <laughs> So you, you have to understand the context or, or what the possibilities are. And, you know, some, some people are so ingrained in the current mindset that they're not going to change. And, and I, I finally got to a point of saying, I have to begin every day under the premise that everything I currently believe could be wrong. Uh, 
I'm putting that in my contract. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, sorry, I'm talking over people now. Sorry, Joan, you had a few comments in the, in the chat. Do you want to um, talk to those at all? Sorry, I'm in a bit of a noisy environment, so I've been on mute and video. Um, oh, I just think one of the underlying premises that we're grappling with here is that most assumptions are based on linearity, you know, linear cause and effect. So if, um, but often it's the nonlinear and the paradox of what the of what seems obvious. Um, that is actually required. So the reframing is how do we help people let go of linearity um, and linear assumptions and kind of direct cause and effect and start to work with the notion of, of paradox um, in really complex situations. My experience is that, um, you know, giving people the sense of sometimes you actually have to do the opposite of what you think is required. But what I see in organizations all the time is that people make the assumption around mostly the linear causal obvious solution, when in fact, the paradox of that is often required. And, and when it doesn't work, they push harder, right? Yeah, more resource, yeah. You, know, yeah, I think, yeah. you know, to your point. So it's always linear and more are the solutions like if i say to leaders so what are your assumptions about how you might address this you know more communication more resource it's it's usually a, a kind of you know the archetype or the trope is more of something the same but more of and just direct linear hit it you know as as in the opposite um rather than in the paradoxical though so well, and maybe not the paradoxical sometimes, but the oblique sometimes as well. Just you know, there might be something slightly tangential that opens opens it up. Well, tangential as well. Yeah, I'm just yeah. One yeah. of them is paradox, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, the, the things that I experience and the things that I read continue to to cause me to believe you have to find a different approach. You have to find a way to to foster a realization on their part without having them getting the sense that you're trying to convince them of something. The thing yeah. that I said about, about moments in terms of the clear insight compressed in time delivered in a way that the, the person or persons discovers it. There's, there was one of the Heath books, <clears throat> they talk about this one person in the organization, it's a multinational corporation realized that they were spending an absolute fortune buying gloves for people who are doing different things in different segments of the organization. So he tasked one person to go to every segment of the organization and find one pair of gloves, one an example of one of each kind of glove that they were purchasing and what the purchase price was. And they laid them all out on a bunch of conference tables in the conference room and invited the executives to come look. Policies changed that day. Because they it was obvious from looking at it that they were throwing money away. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's not <clears throat> here's what we found. Okay. What do you think? <laughs> it's a no-brainer. What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I'm totally aligned, uh, Jean, with your discovery principle, but I think there are, you know, different mechanisms we have available to us to help people discover their meaning making, to discover the assumptions that they're holding that have become their own constraints. Um, and I think we have to, yeah, do more and more of that work um, and find more and more tools to help you know, people make that discovery for that to be discoverable rather than to tell them what it is. Um, mm -hmm. So very, very aligned um, with that as, a, as the principle. I'm just reflecting on that. Um, 
it seems consistent with with Joanne Joanne's observations and others is that going back to Jean's observation that people will run a mile rather than or have a root canal rather than developing a model. You don't need a model to do linear thinking, but you probably need a simple model or some visualization to to make sense of um, of, of these um, more complex effects. Um, I guess my question is. Well, it seems like, you know, there's folks here who quite like making models and, and others. Um, Jean, if you've given some thought to where it is opportune to, um, to, to help people fish for them, fish for themselves and get more sophisticated. And it looks like you've made many, many attempts over the years. What, what's your current thinking of well, the next generation? The, the comment about <clears throat> help me understand what you're wrestling with. And I'll take notes. And and my notes look like a model, but I've never said model. I've just put words down and and drawn lines connecting the things that you've told me. And and it's very it repeatedly proves to be extremely seductive. Show don't tell and make it very much in their con in their immediate context where they have mm -hmm. have a need or a desire yeah makes a lot of sense cool susan, susan have you still got your hand up for a question or is that a left over hand so a left over hand it, it, it was a left over hand but i will say that um <laughs> if any of you are, are familiar with um clean language and um and caitlin um, I can't remember her last name, but but anyway, I think that you know what what to Jean's point, um, people aren't entering the space with a sense of curiosity. Um, you're going to uh, you're going to generate contempt, and when you do, ears shut down, and so that the clean language does help you unpack where they're at. Um, so it's a good uh, investigative tool in addition to. Uh, just helping to um, not generate contempt. I think one of the tools, um, and of course I would talk about this, anyone who knows my work, but you know, one of the tools is to invite people into the role of discoverer. So just, you know, for temporarily, um, you know, step into role of discoverer and explorer with me. Let's set that relational pattern up for a moment and let's see what we can discover together um, mm -hmm. is i find a very useful way of creating the kind of conditions for helping people let go of being expert being right being locked into their own current frames um, because role drives behavior so you know it's one way of dislodging people and helping kind of create a scaffold into the curiosity into the discovery and i find that really works a lot of the time because it just temporarily suspends them from being expert all knowing i know this um what's happening here i have the solution which is generally the role that leaders are gifted right i mean what are we paying you for if not to have an answer um and so just even for a moment asking them to suspend that role and step into role of discoverer and explorer they can go back into their role of expert when we're done. Generally, they they don't they don't have to in relation to that particular context or challenge is one which I think is quite helpful. I I am here to enable you to realize how smart you are. Yep. Cool. Um, I, I, I never, did have I one never... request. Yes, Susan. Uh, can you explain the difference between um, Insight Maker and Kumo? And In Insight Maker was developed as a stock and flow simulation environment. So it's quantitative. Kumo is qualitative. It's pretty pictures. Okay. And <clears throat> I just posted a link to this is my Kumu template, all of my models look the same because I got tired of spending an inordinate amount of time developing all of the background definitions I wanted 
to make my models look the way I wanted them to look. <clears throat> so you can go here and clone this and make a copy that it belongs to you. And there are five short videos that explain all of the pieces and why they're set up the way they are. Cool. I'm gonna have to run away. Um, unfortunately, back to back meetings is always the way. Um, I'm gonna sign off, but uh, the Zoom shouldn't shut down because I think Gene is co-host. So if you guys wanna continue the chat, you can. I'll stop the recording now though. So you can start swearing and uh, burping all <laughs> that place if you want to, um, using safe language, of course. Um, but um, thanks very much, Jean, for, for um, coming along and sharing what is way too much for my head to take in in one session. So I'll be playing this back a hundred times and going off to also have a look at the things on, on Kumu at the same time. And thanks everybody who came along and contributed as well. Um, have a great rest of the day and um, see you in um, Systems well, at Play. Dave, before you leave, I, uh, I, on an ongoing basis, I do um, Kumu Kickstart sessions with people. I can make you extremely dangerous in about 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, let's, um, maybe we can set one of those up and uh, invite uh, some of the Systems of Play community to, to join in as well. So um, we'll, we'll follow that up, Gene. That'd be great. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So much.